history class. It'll be a fun class. I'm going to be a student as well. How many of you have heard about cryptocurrencies, blockchain, Bitcoin, all of that kind of stuff? Do you know a lot about it? Do you understand it a little bit? Um, well, it looks like it's going to be around. I read a book and didn't understand any of it. <laughs> so a couple of years ago, I ran into to, uh, Josh, Josh McIntyre, who graduated in 2017 from here, a computer science major, and he's a software engineer of Microsoft. <coughs> so he sent me an email and said, hey, remember when you and I talked about Bitcoin and all of that kind of stuff? I said, yep. He said, I'll be glad to do a lecture for your class. So I said, super. So he's going to do the class today and then also in investments too. And if for those of you that are in both classes, you know you don't have to attend both of them. So. Good deal. Josh, Hi. you're up. <coughs> well, first off, I want to sincerely thank all you guys for being here on a Monday morning. You knew ahead of time that some weirdo was going to be here to tell you about magic internet money in your ear. So thank you. <laughs> um, so as Dr. Bromovic said, this is going to be an introduction, just a brief introduction to cryptocurrencies with a little bit more of a focus for finance students. So first off, I love when I go to any talk or lecture and the speaker tells me a little bit about who they actually are and what their biases are. Because I think it's important to know where somebody's coming from when they're speaking to you. So I'm a 2017 graduate in computer science from St. Vincent. And I'm currently a software engineer at a division of Microsoft working in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm coming at this from a computer science perspective, uh, talking a little bit about what Bitcoin actually is, how it works, and how its kind of unique properties uh, make it interesting in the world of finance and society. I don't actually have a formal finance background. So in terms of kind of the nitty gritty about trading and value in Bitcoin markets, I'm not as knowledgeable there. So I'm more here to give you kind of an overview and talk about you know, why it's interesting, why it's useful. So if you're not familiar with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, you're probably asking the question, what is Bitcoin? Uh, you'll hear me mention Andreas Antonopoulos probably a couple times throughout this lecture. He's a technologist, a security expert, and pretty much the premier evangelist when it comes to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And he coined a term that he calls the internet of money. And I really like that term because it's a really succinct way of describing what Bitcoin actually is. We already have money on the internet, right? I bet a lot of you have probably used PayPal or the Cash App, where you have an app on your phone where you send money to people. But that's just using money over the existing internet. Bitcoin is actually more akin to a version of the internet itself. It's a set of protocols that define a currency. It defines how do we send money from person A to person B? How do we create currencies? So it really creates an entire network of money rather than just a different way of doing money over an existing network. So there's a couple really key important properties of Bitcoin that make it a little more interesting than the kind of money that we're used to. The first really big one is that Bitcoin is decentralized. With traditional money, fiat currency like US dollars, the yen, the euro, there's a central authority like the Federal Reserve that mints the money, controls interest rates, does all of these things in the markets that define what money is and how much of it there is. There's no central authority in Bitcoin. Rather, Bitcoin is actually a peer-to-peer -peer network. Again, I mentioned it's this protocol that defines how the money is issued, how you send it from one person to another. So how many of you, be honest, have used <coughs> BitTorrent or something like that to download maybe a movie, you know, something that you wanted that you didn't want to pay for maybe? Um, Bitcoin is like that, but for money. It's entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no central servers. There's no anything like that. It is you run a piece of software on your computer, and you and you run a piece of software on your computer. And that software communicates back and forth without having to deal with any sort of central uh, man in the middle. So the second one, and this is maybe a little bit 
could be a more unfamiliar terminology if you don't have a little bit of computer science background. But Bitcoin is cryptographically secured. Cryptography is a branch of math that defines how do you deal with secret information, how can you obscure information, which is encryption, and things like that. All of you have used encryption if you've logged on to the internet today. Modern websites use uh, protocols like HTTPS to encrypt your connection. Uh, when you go to a website, all the data between you and the web server is obscured. And so that's an example of cryptography. And Bitcoin uses a number of cryptographic concepts to secure the network without having to have trusted parties. So concepts like digital signatures, proof of work, and uh, you know, the big one is the blockchain, the blockchain database. That's kind of the term that everybody hears, especially in the business world. So because of this decentralization, this peer-to-peer -peer network, and because of this cryptography, the big key point is that Bitcoin is trustless. You don't have to trust any central authority to issue the money. You don't have to trust any central authority in the middle to validate transactions between two people. Normally, if you send somebody else in this room money, say on a credit card or PayPal, PayPal is in the middle validating that you have the money, you own the money, and that you can send it to her, and now allows her to have ownership over that money. Well, in Bitcoin, this is entirely done by the software protocol and by people running this software and using cryptography. So, I want to talk a little bit about the technical end of Bitcoin. And I don't want anybody to feel intimidated or confused. If you don't have a computer science background, if this seems like it's a foreign language, that's okay. But the technical properties of Bitcoin, the technical inner workings are really what give us those interesting, uh, those interesting properties, those interesting characteristics of the currency that allow it to work in this way that's so different from money that we're used to using. So the first concept, and this is probably the one you've heard of, is the blockchain database. So what's a blockchain? Every 10 minutes or so on the Bitcoin network, people are sending each other these transactions. You know, you're sending a dollar to him, she's sending $3 million to her, you know, you can send any amount of money on this network. About every 10 minutes, transactions are grouped together and processed in what are called blocks. And so all of these transactions are put together and the uh, people running the block, the, the Bitcoin software on the network are doing uh, these validation problems. They're actually looking at the transactions, looking at the rest of the blockchain and making sure that you own the money that you say you do, you're able to send it to this other person using some of this cryptography. And so as these transactions are all validated together, they're added into the blockchain in that new block. Now the really interesting thing that you need to take away from this is not really the inner workings of the blockchain, but it's the fact that each block is cryptographically linked to the previous block. There's a little bit of math going on there that says this new block is dependent on the information that's included in the previous block. And that block is dependent on the information that's included in the block before that. Another interesting and important concept here is what's called proof of work. <clears throat> Probably one of the questions you have floating around in your head about Bitcoin is, how do you issue this currency? How can this money exist in, on this peer-to-peer -peer network without somebody saying, uh, you know, a central person issuing the money without there being just rampant fraud everywhere where you just spin up the software and you just type in your computer and now I have 10 Bitcoin, ha. Huh? There's this concept called proof of work. So remember I said every 10 minutes these transactions are being grouped into blocks and they're being validated and processed. Well every block there's this ingenious algorithm where thousands of computers on the network running this Bitcoin software are racing to solve this cryptographic puzzle. This is essentially a math problem where to find the answer you have to guess, and you have to guess a lot. In fact, you have to do about 10 minutes worth of computing guesswork to potentially find the answer to this problem. But once you have the answer, 
It only takes one step for any person in the world to verify that answer is correct. And that's why we call it proof of work. Because if you have an answer to this cryptographic problem, you have essentially proved that you expended your computing power and your electricity to find that answer. So what this does is this links this ephemeral, entirely digital currency to real world resources. If you want to mine Bitcoin, if you want to validate transactions on the network and participate, you have to use your electricity and computing power. And you have to use a lot of it. So the last important component is these digital signatures. So each wallet user has something called a private key, and that proves that you own some amount of Bitcoin. Your address is derived from that private key, and that is the public facing number that says, here, here's where you send money to me. You can't go backwards from a public key or address to a private key. So you could spend billions and billions of years trying to guess what somebody's private key is from their public key, and you'll never figure it out. This is another concept of cryptography called elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. So all those concepts are linked together in a way that cryptographically secures the blockchain in this Bitcoin currency without having to trust anyone. Because you have proof of work, people can't easily create fraudulent transactions. Because if people are trying to defraud the network and say, oh yeah, I, I, he sent me 50 Bitcoin when he only sent you one, you would have to do more computing work with your computer in 10 minutes than the entire rest of the world. I wonder, does it kind of make sense? I want to pause for a second if there's any questions on that. Questions? And you have these digital signatures that say, you can prove that you own some amount of Bitcoin at this public address, and anybody can validate that you own that amount of money on the blockchain, but you never have to reveal your private key that says you own it. And because these blocks are linked together, the further back you go in history, the harder and harder it is to fake a transaction. We say in the Bitcoin world, if you were to try to defraud somebody six blocks back, so say 60 minutes ago somebody sent you 50 Bitcoin and you really wish they sent you 100, it is mathematically impossible for you to tell the network that you have more Bitcoin than you do because you could never outpace the amount of computing power that the rest of the network is using to secure itself if you were the US government. That's how much computing power goes into securing the Bitcoin network. So I know that might be a little bit computer science-y, and that's okay. But I really wanted to touch on the point of how this is actually secured, because that's what gives Bitcoin its useful properties. That's what makes Bitcoin different than all the money that we're used to using. So this is the more finance-oriented part of the talk, so hopefully maybe I see some more smiles in the audience and less confusion, so that'll be good. So why does Bitcoin have value? If you remember last year, if anybody has been interested in this, can anybody tell me what the value of one Bitcoin was last year at its all-time high? 20,000, well, 20, one Bitcoin was worth 20,000 US dollars. To put this in perspective, when the Bitcoin network started, there actually was no US dollar value. And in the early days, there was a gentleman on a Bitcoin forum named Laszlo. And this is, this is a really interesting story. This is before there was any, any markets. This was before Coinbase, where you could just buy Bitcoin with the click of a button. This guy said, I really like this digital currency. And he had been mining in the early days when it was easy to mine a lot with just a regular computer. And you didn't need specialized tools to, to solve this cryptographic problem. And Laszlo said, I want to buy a pizza with my Bitcoin. So Laszlo contacted another member on the forum. This gentleman used his credit card, bought two pizzas, maybe $20. Got two medium pizzas. He's happy. He's got a full belly. 
and he got to use his Bitcoin as currency. The amount of Bitcoin he sent that other forum user to buy two pizzas was 10,000 Bitcoins. Somebody do the math for me. At the all-time high, that was millions, possibly billions of dollars worth of pizza. So Bitcoin has really gone up and down in value. And why is that? Well, the unique properties of Bitcoin that I talked about, this decentralization, this trustlessness that no other kind of money has, it makes Bitcoin useful. It's not just a neat little trick or a neat little thing. You know, it first came out and people were kind of like, heh, nerd money. You know, there was nothing, nothing really interesting about it. It was like, you know, people playing Dungeons and Dragons sending each other tokens. No, no, one in the, no one in the real world wanted anything to do with this. But as the years went on, people said, wow, this Bitcoin thing. You can send money, I can send money to somebody across the world for a fraction of a penny in transaction fees. I can send them $500 or a million dollars and it doesn't change the fee. There's no borders, there's no banks, there's no waiting, like a wire transfer. There's no Western Union $40 fee on that $100. So it's really starting to pique people's interest. And again, when we go back to this proof of work algorithm, because it's useful, people will expend real world resources to actually maintain this network. So remember, this is an entirely digital currency. It's not backed by gold. It's not backed by any other precious commodity. It's, it's ephemeral. It's bits and bytes on a computer, like a photograph. But if you want to participate in this network, if you want to mine the currency, if you want to secure it, you're spending a lot of electricity and a lot of computing power. And at the end of the day, that's real. You say, this Bitcoin thing has value to me. And there are people spending quite literally millions of dollars a year in electricity to secure the network, to make a little bit of money mining, and to make sure that this thing keeps existing. And why is that? Because it's useful. And because it's useful, people assign value to it. It's much like the US dollar. We used to have a gold standard, right? So your US dollars, you could actually go to a bank and say, I want a dollar's worth of gold for my dollar bill. Now, can anybody tell me how long it's been since it's actually been the case? If I'm not mistaken, since about the 60s, right? I think it was Richard Nixon that closed the gold window officially and said, you know, if you come to, come to the bank with your dollar, you don't give the, the person gold anymore. How many of you want to take some dollar bills out of your wallet right now and light them on fire? They're worthless, right? They're not backed by anything. No, but they're useful. You know, if you walk over to the calf and give them seven or eight dollars, you'll get a meal. You know, if you send somebody 20 US dollars on a credit card over the internet, they will send you a t-shirt. It's useful, we all use it every day. And Bitcoin, much in the same way, is useful. It's, it's a unique way of doing money. And so these markets have developed over the years where people trade it. And you know, again, I'm not necessarily familiar with why the price bounces up and down so much and the financial forces behind that. But suffice it to say, one Bitcoin is still worth a couple thousand dollars. And there's a lot of variants like Bitcoin Cash, there's Ethereum, there's Litecoin, all worth varying amounts, but they're worth, all of them are worth well more than actually one dollar. So people find these useful. And they will trade real dollars for them. So what are some of the financial implications of this? What's going to change if this Bitcoin thing really continues to take off? Well, the first thing is, is there's less need for trusted institutions. You know, I certainly don't want to be political about it, but there's a lot of debate about what goes on in institutions like the Federal Reserve. There's a lot of debate about the power that modern corporate banks have in our society and the influence they have on our lives. I mean, if we look at the 2008 financial crisis, some people put the blame in different places, but there were certainly some failures in our traditional monetary system. Well, with Bitcoin, you have this money that is completely by and for the people. The software protocol is written in an open source way so any developer can contribute to it. Anybody can fire up an app on their cell phone and participate in this network and send each other money. If 
you have the resources, you can mine to help secure the network. And there's no need to trust any third party to actually process the transactions. When I send you money on the Bitcoin network, there's no central clearinghouse like ACH or a credit card company validating that I have the money and that you now own it. This is entirely done by software and entirely validated by all the people collectively acting together on the network. It's also interesting because this is an interesting, uh, unique way of looking at digital money. The way Bitcoin behaves is like digital cash. It's not like a credit card or a debit card even. When you have a debit card, you have a credit card, what you really have, well a credit card is a line of credit. Some bank says, I will loan you money to make this purchase. When you have a debit card, your bank says, we are holding in trust for you some amount of money, and if you swipe your card, we will make sure that that money gets to the merchant. Well, in the Bitcoin world, he who holds the private keys holds the money. End of story. Without getting too much into the technical details and confusing everybody, when you have a Bitcoin app on your phone and you have your Bitcoin app holds those private keys, it is the digital equivalent of having a $20 bill in your pocket. You own that money. There is no Bitcoin bank that validates, yeah, yeah, Josh has $20. I hold the key that tells the rest of the Bitcoin network I have $20. Just like a dollar on my phone. Or a dollar in my wallet, rather. If I drop my phone in the toilet and don't have a backup of my private keys, my money is gone. It is nowhere else. So, what this means in terms of security is really unique as well. You have to breach individuals, not institutions. When Target gets hacked, when some other merchant gets hacked and you lose all your credit card information, you were trusting somebody else to keep your credit card information safe and they failed you. And that one merchant was a central point of failure that was unable to stop an attacker from getting in. But with Bitcoin, the buck stops with the user. So if I want to get thousands and thousands of Bitcoin, I have to figure out how to hack your wallet and your wallet and your wallet. And that is much, much harder to do. It happens. You know, you can mug somebody on the street for their wallet. And you can use some trickery to get people to give up their private keys. But as a whole, this security model is a lot harder to break when you have to target individual users rather than central institutions. Banks do spend millions and billions of dollars every year to make sure that their networks are secure, but at the end of the day, it takes one smart person to get through the walls and have access to the funds of quite literally thousands of people. You have to do that for every individual with cryptocurrencies. So these are some interesting ones too. What are the societal implications? We're pretty accustomed, we live in the United States, we're pretty accustomed to privileged banking. You walk down to the bank, you give them some ID, you get a checking account. And that's not the case all over the world. So banking the unbanked is a very large potential impact of Bitcoin. Believe it or not, in many third world economies, they have these. They have cell phone towers, they have cell phones in their pocket, and they don't have landlines. They just kind of skip the landline thing. They certainly don't have the infrastructure for the kind of privileged banking that we have. The nearest branch of their local bank could be hundreds of miles away. But with Bitcoin, all you need is a cell phone, and a cell phone tower and data connection, and an app on your phone, and you have a bank. And not only do you have a bank, you have a bank that you control by yourself, which is pretty cool. As well, Bitcoin is borderless. There are restrictions on sending money across borders. You know, it may be sent by the bank, it may be sent by governments. If you are a migrant worker, in the United States and you're making some money and you want to send it to your family back home, 
Western Union might charge you 30 or 40 percent of your money just to get that money back to your family. With a cryptocurrency, you're talking fractions of a penny. And it's there, it's in their cell phone wallet in 10 minutes. They own it. There's no checkpoint, no nothing. Imagine a darker situation. Imagine you're stuck in a military conflict somewhere. You may be a Palestinian living in the West Bank. There may be some other conflict that you can imagine where confiscation, repression of exchange, are a real threat and a real risk. Somebody can take your gold from you. Somebody can take your paper money from you pretty easily if you're trying to cross a border or anything like that. Well, number one, this goes by on a network. So if you have a data connection, bye-bye money, you can send it to anyone. You can send it to your family that has escaped. And here's a really cool thing. The developers in the Bitcoin space invented a system. You can back up an entire wallet, millions of transactions, billions of dollars, into 12 to 24 English words. Let me say that again. The way that Bitcoin works with the private keys and the way that they're generated, you can memorize 12 to 24 random English words, take it from a specialized dictionary, and you have a wallet that could contain millions of dollars, could contain any amount of money, and that can't be confiscated from you, from your head, if you're in a conflict somewhere. They can take your gold, but they can't take 12 words that are hidden in your brain. And when you get somewhere safe, you plug those 12 words into a piece of software on your phone or a computer, and there's your money. That's pretty mind-blowing, isn't it? And that can really change the way that people living in conflict deal with money. Bitcoin is a pretty hot commodity in Venezuela right now, where they're dealing with some pretty serious military conflict. And a fiat currency, by the way, that has become so hyperinflated that it's useless. You might as well light it on fire for warmth because it's more it's worth more to you as warmth than it is as a means of exchange. With Bitcoin, there's no government getting in the way, there's no hyperinflation getting in the way. It's really, really valuable when you step outside kind of the window that we live in with checking accounts and PayPal and the Cash App and see what this could potentially do for people around the world. So here's my final thoughts on this. Bitcoin is very clearly an entirely different way of doing money. It's unlike anything that we've ever experienced in our lives. I mean, we thought the credit card was a revolution, but Bitcoin is something on a completely different level. Decentralization and trustlessness are very key central properties of Bitcoin. And that gives the power to you and I Instead of large institutions, corrupt institutions, you name it. If you don't like the Fed, if you don't like big banks, whatever political views you may have about those sorts of things, however you want to take it, Bitcoin is wonderful because the power is with us. We ultimately, you know, as developers working in an open source way, decide how the protocol works. As users, you vote for how the software works every time you open up an app. Because there's different versions of this currency. There's different, there's different uh, currencies entirely. Maybe you prefer the way Litecoin works over Ethereum. Well, when you open up a Litecoin app and choose to exchange in Litecoin, you vote and say, I find this currency useful. And that's really powerful. And by the way, this is just scratching the surface. I highly recommend folks look more into this. Um, it's just fascinating what you can potentially do with this. And you know, some things are more useful than others. Uh, you know, buying t-shirts with Bitcoin is really cool. I've done it. But at the end of the day, for me, in the first world, it's just as easy to swipe a credit card. I get that. It might be hard to see. But there are some use cases for this that are truly, in a way, revolutionary. So I definitely want to leave you with some recommended resources. Uh, many of the stories that I told today about Laszlo and, and some of the points I made today, I learned from Andreas Antonopoulos. 
I really, really recommend looking into this guy. He was the original Bitcoin evangelist. Um, he has a YouTube channel. Uh, he, you know, he's on LinkedIn and all of that. He has some really great lectures that go from uh, very broad top, uh, kind of broad topics like I talked about today, down to the very technical parts as well. Um, if there's any podcast fans, I'm a huge fan of the Joe Rogan Experience, and he has, I want to say, four four appearances on there now, uh, which are you know a couple hours long a piece. So there's some really interesting information you can get there. And he has a couple of books out. The Internet of Money is a collection of adaptive <coughs> talks. Um, he goes around speaking a lot, like I am today, and uh, some of those talks about you know society and technology and banking uh, are encompassed in that book. And if you're a little more technically minded, this book here, Mastering Bitcoin, this has been like my Bible trying to learn about this stuff. This is for software engineers, for IT people, for anyone that wants to learn more about how Bitcoin works really, really in depth. Uh, this all started actually from a white paper, a little like scientific paper that's published online. It's like 11, 12 pages long. It's a little technical, uh, but it's a pretty solid summary of how it works. And this is from the source. This is from the guy that invented it. And then lastly, there's plenty of websites online. Uh, Bitcoin.com, Bitcoin.org, uh, the Bitcoin Wiki. And I just want to leave you with a final warning. Uh, be wary of biases. Much like any other very interesting topic, some divides exist in the community about uh, software implementations, about you know what Bitcoin should be used for, those kind of things. So uh, you know, just just anytime you go to a resource, just like you're reading a newspaper, uh, look at it with a skeptical eye and see if you can figure out where they're coming from, bias-wise. Uh, but generally, you know, if you're looking into the technology itself, you get a pretty good idea of what it's all about, pretty consistently across platforms. All right. So last one. You guys like free stuff? Yeah, yeah. You like free stuff. You're in college. I love free stuff when I was in college. I'm out of college. I like free stuff. I have money. So I'm sure you guys have your cell phones on. I'm giving you permission. I don't know if Dr. Bromovic's cell phone rules in class. I'm giving you permission to pull this out or pull out your laptop. If you want to, go to Bitcoin.com and download the Bitcoin.com wallet. And you can set up a wallet. The particular currency I'm going to use today is a variant of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Cash, which is designed a little bit more for day-to-day -day transactions than the original Bitcoin is. That's a long story, but we're using Bitcoin Cash. Um, as time permits, at the end of the class, come see me. And if you want some Bitcoin, I'll send you some. I'm not going to make you rich, but everybody should be able to walk out here with like a dollar or so of Bitcoin if you want. Maybe 50 cents. You're going to see how much I have. <laughs> Um, I thought that might be cool as well. So if it's something you're interested in, I'll show you how it works. You'll see the magic of scanning a QR code and all of a sudden having magic internet money coming across the airwaves to your phone. And perfect time. I wanted to leave about 20 minutes for questions. So um, I hope you found this really interesting. Again, thank you for your attention. And I'd really like to open it up. Ask me anything you can think of about Bitcoin, and I'll try the best I can to answer it. So is like is the blockchain held in a database somewhere, like in California or like somewhere in the world, or is it all in the cloud? That's a really good question. Uh, it's cloud-based, you could say. So there's a couple different types of Bitcoin wallets. The one that's on your phone is called a SPV wallet, Simplified Payment Verification. A phone wallet doesn't hold the blockchain. There's about, the, the whole blockchain is about, I want to say like 300 gigabytes now. It's a lot of data. Um, so certain types of wallets can only get information that they need from the blockchain. So they'll get some particular data from the blockchain that's uh, relevant to your addresses that are generated for your wallet. But a lot of wallets are what are called full node wallets. So remember I said it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, kind of like BitTorrent, where you know you have some parts of the movie and other person has parts of the movie and your client goes out and fetches it from, from other people that are hosting it. The blockchain is very similar. So anyone that's running a full node wallet has a full copy of the blockchain. So if you download a new wallet on your computer and you want to run a full node, your wallet will go out and talk to other clients that it can find that are running. Does that make sense? 
So it's, uh, it is in the cloud in a way, but it, it's more than just uh, in somebody's Dropbox somewhere. It's, it's a peer-to-peer -peer thing. So many people have many copies of this, and they all work together to keep it synced and updated and, and validated. And that's actually really important uh, because the fact that multiple people have a copy of it, anybody can independently verify that the transactions are correct. So if I get a copy of the new block that was developed, my wallet is actually going to go through and manually do all the cryptography and check and make sure that everything is, is right. So, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got a few questions. Um, so the thing with the third world countries and stuff, um, I know there's been cases of people like are kind of like prolific on social media. They have uh, openly, they're open about having a lot of Bitcoin, and then they'll get just mods. They'll say, "Hey, have we done anything? <coughs> some of your Bitcoin?" <coughs> so there's really no like protections as far as that goes. What do you think uh, to help that issue? Because there's really no like, yeah. there's no intermediary. There's no protection. That, that's another good uh, good point to bring up. The great thing is, it's actually a lot harder. Just, even though Bitcoin is digital cash, it's a lot harder to steal your Bitcoin out of this than it is to steal $20 out of your wallet. So there's some pretty cool technology. So um, say somebody in the street has a gun to you and they say, I want you, I know you have Bitcoin in that phone. I want you to send it to me. You can even have a special pin in your wallet software, depending on the implementation, that has a duress wallet. You say, I, all I got is $10 in here, but the rest of it's hidden somewhere. And they can't know, I mean, unless they steal your phone and do a forensic analysis on it, which they're not going to do while they're trying to mug you. Um, you know, I highly advise everyone, just as a software engineer, as a tech nerd, please put a pin on this thing. Like, don't let somebody that, like, just finds your phone somewhere that you left it, like, be able to look at all your pictures and stuff. But, you know, you have a pin on your phone, you have a pin on your wallet. You might even have a spending pin for your wallet. So you have to have a pin to get in the wallet, and then you have to have a pin to send it to somebody. So it's a lot easier to steal this. Like, you could steal somebody's, you know, it's it's a pretty unlikely scenario unless you know someone is holding. Like, you recognize some Bitcoin baller from Instagram on the streets, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that, like, somebody has a million dollars on this phone. And so probably what you're going to do is just point a gun to them and say, give me your phone and your wallet and run away. Does that make, make sense? And the other thing is, too, is, okay, so I talked a lot about mobile wallets, because th this is a great way to do Bitcoin accessibly. Like, everyone in here probably has a smartphone. Um, if you're a Bitcoin baller and you got millions of dollars, don't keep it all on your phone. Um, there are technologies like hardware wallets that are um, designed, the hardware is specifically designed to do the cryptography around Bitcoin and nothing else, so it can't... Um, you know, run arbitrary, malicious code like a virus. Like the hardware itself for the wallet only does Bitcoin stuff. Uh, you can even do cold wallets where you actually print out the private keys that correspond to your addresses and put them in a, a vault somewhere for a later date. Say, you know, your sewer line breaks, and I really wish I had lots of Bitcoin when my sewer line broke this year. And, uh, you know, you scan it in and there's your money. So, you know, you're not storing billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin on your phone, I hope. You had a question, Dr. Puglia? Yeah, but you had a couple, didn't you? Yeah, so what um, happens, like you said, there's a fee every time you send money. Mm -hmm. uh, since it's centralized, what happens to that fee and why? What is the purpose of the fee? Nice. Also a very good question. So, uh, remember how I said this currency is issued <coughs> in a completely decentralized way by people running software? Uh, that, those people are called miners. Uh, you may have heard that term if you've looked into Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. Um, people are running a specialized software called mining software that's trying to solve that cryptographic problem, right? The person that finds the answer to that problem every 10 minutes gets two things. They get a predetermined amount of new Bitcoin, so that's how it's issued. So if you find the answer to the cryptographic problem for this block, Every, you know, for this set of 10 minutes, you, the miner, the person running that software is rewarded with the new Bitcoin. That's how it's issued. They also get all of the transaction fees included in that block. Now, when the network is crowded, for example, um, Bitcoin, without, you know, getting too much into the nerdy details, Bitcoin Core, the original Bitcoin, has a set limit on the number of transactions that can run every 10 minutes. And when the network gets crowded, not everybody gets in in that 10 minutes. 
And so the higher the transaction fee, the more likely a miner is going to want to include your transaction in that block. Make sense? So it's an incentive for the miners to do what they're doing, which is expending their electricity to secure the network, and they are rewarded with those transaction fees. Do you have one more? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'll just go with um, basically the US dollar. So uh, since there's really no incentive at all for uh, like the government to adopt, because they'd be giving up control. Right. Uh, basically, third world countries, if it gets so bad, maybe that's like the next step for them, but for America as a whole, uh, do you think it's an alternative to uh, US dollars or it's a successor to US dollars? It's a hard question to answer. It really depends. So again, I go back to the fact that we're pretty accustomed to privileged banking here. Um, all in all, although you know we worry about inflation and things that are going into the U.S. markets, the U.S. dollar is like the currency in the world. It's pretty stable. But you kind of answer the question yourself. There's a lot. Bitcoin goes up and down. Like if you watch the price charts for Bitcoin, it'll make your head spin. But there are still a number of countries in the third world where Bitcoin is the stable currency. Like again, if you look at Venezuela and the, the type of hyperinflation that's, ha that's happening there, Bitcoin is holding its value a lot more than that currency is. And so third world com countries may be more likely to adopt that. They might even create a cryptocurrency specifically for that country, you know, where people, you know, it's, you know, Nigeria coin or something like that. You know, it's a possibility, or they might just use Bitcoin because it's actually the stable version. In terms of the US dollar, I think it's going to be a long time before we see uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a really day to day thing. I think we have a long way to go in terms of usability of the software. You still have to be a little bit tech savvy to use it. it you know, it's pretty simple for any of us in this room, I think, to, to pop open a mobile phone and understand, okay, this is my address and I give you this QR code that you scan and send money. But like, I mean, imagine teaching that to your grandma. She's like, doesn't know how to turn the thing on, right? You know, um, email 20 years ago, you had to know Unix command line to send email. You know, you had to know DOS. You had to be able to type on a keyboard and type commands in to send somebody an email. And then it took 10 days for the email to get there across the network. I mean, come on, how many of you know how to use email? It's like, it's the whole room, I hope. <laughs> right? <laughs> we have a long way to go in terms of usability as well, in terms of obscuring some of the technical details. Like, you know, when you go to Google.com, you don't have to know Google's IP address, right? How many of you even know what an IP address really is? You don't have to worry about it because we developed a technology that obscures the tech technical details. Uh, we got to get there with Bitcoin more for it to be something that I think we see getting used in the U.S. as a day-to-day -day currency. You had a question. So that was actually my question on what was the benefit to mine if you answered that. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe, actually, can you speculate a little bit on can it be corrupt? I mean, right now it can't be, but if there is, if there's money, right, people oh, who would yeah. corrupt would try. How, how oh, boy. Corrupt? So I'm going to get like lynched on the internet for this. I, there's some there's some divides in the Bitcoin community. Um, one of the big ones in recent years has been scalability. Remember, I said you know there's a set amount of transactions you can fit into a block in 10 minutes. We reached a point a couple years ago where I sent myself some Bitcoin with like a five dollar fee, and it took three days to get processed by the network because it was so clogged. There are organizations that believe in these small blocks. Now there's people who have come up with these big block technologies. Bitcoin Cash uses really large blocks, so they can do a lot of transactions. And um, you know, you asked about corruption. I'm, I'm getting here. The point is, there are these very deep political divides in the Bitcoin community, and some of it is, in fact, speculated to be due to corruption. Um, the Bitcoin Core development, although it's open source, is mostly headed by people in a company called Blockstream, um, which has funding from some major banks, and there's some sort of, there's some speculation there that there's some corruption going on, that they are kind of intentionally crippling the network a little bit, and trying to develop these other solutions um, that kind of, you know, that's a little bit conspiracy theory-ish. Um, another big one is uh, MT Gox, don't know if that rings a bell. 
In 2014, there was an online exchange that stored everybody's money for them. And this was headed out of somewhere in Japan by this gentleman named Mark Carpellis. And overnight, all the money disappeared and no one knows where it went. And he is currently being prosecuted, but they think he has it somewhere, but we don't know. Um, which is a pretty obvious example of corruption. So we'll see how I'm doing on time here. Cool, we got a couple more minutes. So, you know, that's an easy one. But I want to, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, so, maybe, maybe, how do central banks get their fingers in this and be done? They can, and that kind of goes to the first thing I was talking about, which again, you know, some people in the Bitcoin community say that's conspiracy theory-ish. It makes sense, you know, when large development centers <coughs> in this technology get funded by large banks, large institutions, there is somewhat of an incentive to do things in a certain way that maybe make the way the technology works more centralized. So that's, that's, definitely, that's definitely one way. So what happened there is instead of making larger blocks and having everybody that's you know, running the mining and stuff, you know, just fitting more transactions into 10 minutes, their solution is build new channels on top of the existing blockchain, build this thing called the Lightning Network, uh, which is sort of like an extra layer on top, and that has some sort of centralized aspects to it. Like a lot of the people running the Lightning payment channels would be banks, and they were funding the development of this. So it's like, ah, oh, you know, it's a little bit hokey. So, yeah. I have got a question with because um, the, the miners always sound to me like they're ultimately going to be what we would refer to as banks. Take, take, the, take the bank, forget the bank as we know it today, but somebody that controls a lot of this stuff. So in the future, they might not be banks, they may be miners, but the functionality sounds to me to be similar. So if you think about that, and you think about in the capitalist system, who gets bypassed from Bitcoin or any of these currencies? If I'm sitting at JP Morgan Chase, I'm saying there's no way in hell that I'm allowing this stuff to bypass me, so I'm going to hire the wizards. Yeah. And I'm going to have the wizards that sit around all day, and they're going to be the miners. And I don't care how much it costs me in electricity, servers, because that's all I am anyway. I'm a bank, and all, all I do is process data. Right. So it is, is whether this is conspiracy theory, is this whole thing going to go around and around and around and come back to the banks again? Uh, that's a really good point, and that actually is something that's you know actively discussed in the Bitcoin community is the power. Who holds the power? Is it the users? Is it the developers? Is it the miners? Uh, miners can have a lot of power because you know they are the ones that are expending the resources to validate transactions, to generate currency, and to you know, keep the network up and running. Yeah. Uh, the cool thing about that is is yeah there are some large like mining pools where you know people work together. Um, you know, companies put money into this. But the thing is, is again, at the end of the day, this is an open protocol. Anybody can run the software. So if, you know, if someone doesn't like that one company holds a lot of the power, there can be competition, um, much as there is in, you know, other market systems. So, you know, somebody that really believes in the value of Bitcoin is decentralized and help combat that. And as well, at the end of the day, I mean, a large company has a lot of resources, but there's power in numbers. And anyone in this room can run a Bitcoin mining software. You know, you, you get a fancy computer for it, you know, you plug it in, you let it run a little while, um, you know, maybe your electric bill goes up. But you can, you can participate voluntarily in the network. Um, you can't run your own ACH clearinghouse out of your living room. Well, what are like the skills you need to be a good miner? Just the fancy. Computer. Just the power. Yeah, if you can, really it. you can flip on the software, it'll run. Okay. So it's just the clock who wins? The yeah. yeah, it's just, just sheer, it's sheer brute force computing power, <laughs> actually. So that, that makes it fair, right? Like it's not like, there's not, it's not a math problem for somebody sitting down with a pen and paper and trying to figure it out. It's literally just slamming guesses at this problem until yeah. one pops out correct. 
One, uh, do we have time for one more? One more. One more. Any, did anybody else over here? No, no offense to you or anything. Anybody over here? Cool. Last one. Would it be possible to have, like, so like, take Amazon, for example, they're basically crushing costs of everything. And then eventually people think that once all the competition is on, all those raise prices, you think like a bank that controls so much of mining, and then one day they shut it off, and they, they just value of Bitcoin would tank. Even if there would be like separate miners. Yeah, it's it's possible. And again, you know, the, the security comes through. There's something called a 51% attack where you can do some um, interesting fraud on the network if you control 51% of the mining power. But I mean, the sheer amount of computing power that is spread out makes it pretty difficult to do in a real world sense. The, the, math is, the math is far in favor of people that are trying to transact on the network in a valid way and not fraudsters. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Hey, this was really cool. um, the only thing that I will offer from the dinosaur side of this stuff, I'm a real geek with McKinsey and Company. Um, that is my favorite consulting firm by far. I think they do hire the wizards. They hire the best and the brightest. If you really want to work at an outstanding place, uh, work there. It's hard to get in because they truly only hire the best and the brightest. But they rarely miss. They rarely miss on trends. They rarely miss on the next unbelievable thing that is likely to happen. They do the day-to-day -day consulting stuff. But they also have futurists that look 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future. They're really big on this stuff. They are really big on it. And they talk about data finance constantly. Um, every time that pops up, uh, I always listen to the tape because I'm too lazy to read the whole thing, to the audio. But they're getting into, remember, you're CFO, so they're basically saying, if you're a CFO and you haven't started to do some data finance, you're, you're, getting, you're behind. You're behind, you're behind, you're behind. And it's a lot of this stuff that's going on. So while some of us, especially um, the older people and the seasoned people in the room, may think that this is a little hokey, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more behind this than, than, we, than we know, and that it's further along than we know. So it's really great. Thank, thank you very much, Josh. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you guys for paying attention and being engaged. And I hope it was, I hope it was informative. And